Welcome to this presentation covering Chapter 7 of our textbook. Today we're going to discuss legality in contracts. This, of course, is our last of our four elements of contract law. As you know, we need four things or four ingredients to our contract recipe in order to end up with a contract. We need to have an agreement. We need to have consideration. All the parties have to have legal capacity, and we need legality or legal object in the lawsuit, I mean, in the contract. Those four things, if we're missing any one of those four items, we don't have a contract. We may have something that has legal significance, but we're not going to call that a contract. So again, it's an ingredient that we must have in order to have a contract. So it's important. This is our last of our four requirements. So once we're done with Chapter 7, we'll be moving on um, to some kind of optional considerations, I guess you could say, in contract law. So this is kind of an important milestone in the progress of our course. Let's begin. Okay, so we have a definition, legality. The condition of conformity with the law, lawfulness. Um, this is a, it's kind of an obvious definition, and I think because it's so obvious, I find that students sometimes will miss questions in which the answer to the question is legality because it's like, well, gosh, of course, legality is the answer. Surely Groover wants something more complicated than that. Uh, no, when I ask what is the condition of conformity with the law, I really do want legality. So um, as you're preparing don't and answering test questions, don't overthink these. Sometimes the answer is exactly what you think it is. In this case, it probably will be. So legality is lawfulness. Nothing too, too tough about that one. In order for us to establish legality, though, we, we're going to drill down a little bit more and kind of figure out what do we mean when we say something is legal. Well, when we talk about something being legal, we need to have two aspects. We need to have a legal purpose and a legal subject matter. Now, I'm going to tell you that I'm not going to ask you any test questions where you have a legal purpose but an illegal subject matter or you have an illegal purpose but a legal subject matter. So I'm going to give you a couple of examples here, but I don't want you to fret about these and start thinking, well, gosh, are you sure it's not, it's not this and this or, you know, back backwards and forwards. Um, if this is something that doesn't click with you or uh, whatever, don't worry about it because I'm not going to ask you test questions over this, but I just want to kind of show you a little bit of the flavor of the distinction between the two. So an example might be, I might enter into a contract with a, say, a, a payday lender. Um, it's perfectly lawful for me to borrow money, and it's perfectly lawful for the payday lender to lend me money. So the purpose of the contract is completely lawful. But the subject matter might be illegal if the contract itself was usurious. In other words, the interest rate exceeded the lawful limit. We'll talk more about this topic in a little bit. But you can see in this case that it's 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 our, we have we both have a legal purpose for entering into the contract but the subject matter the actual interest rate is too high legally um let me give you another example um let's say that i am a um uh a, a beer distributor and i want to sell beer to uh my customers well beer is a a lawful subject matter. I don't get arrested for having beer or making beer. It's a perfectly lawful thing to do. But if a minor wanted to enter into a contract with me, we'd say it was for an illegal purpose. The minor isn't of age, so that minor can't consume the alcohol. The beer itself is lawful. It's just not lawful in the hands of the minor. So we would say that contract is for a legal subject matter, but for an illegal purpose. But again, at the end of the day, don't worry about splitting these hairs. Most of the time, both of these will be legal, It'll be for a legal purpose and a legal subject matter, or they'll both be illegal. It takes a lot of thought to come up with one that is one but not the other, and certainly it's uh, hair splitting for us to try to figure out lots and lots of examples of this. So keep in mind we need to have both, but as a practical matter, eh, you'll probably find that if one's illegal, then the other's going to be illegal as well. So what happens if we have a contract that's illegal, either because there's, a, there's an illegal purpose or an illegal subject matter or both are illegal. Usually we're going to find that that contract is void and unenforceable. At the end of this chapter, though, we'll go into some more specifics and actually see kind of where the bodies are buried, so to speak, and exactly what uh, might cause something to be illegal, excuse me, void and unenforceable, and what, and what are the circumstances under which a court might use a bit of a different approach. 
So let's begin. Okay, so we've talked about how we need two things for it to be legal, but we're going to look now at what are the two sources or the two buckets of law that we look to to establish whether there's an illegal subject matter and or an illegal purpose. One thing we look to is a statute. Um, this can be a federal statute or a state statute. I suppose it could even be a, something in a constitution or in a treaty. So really we're talking, we say statute, but really we're talking a uh, primary source of law that's well established. Then we also have another bucket, which is public policy. This is how the textbook divides up the material. I don't really love this division because most of the public policy ideas that you'll see in this section, we've got statutes for them in Texas. I guess our, our state legislature is a little bit more on the ball than some states. So really most of the things that we're calling a public policy issue are really going to be a statutory issue for us. But you'll be able to see in these examples that there is a public policy a lurking behind those statutes. After all, the legislature had to think that there was a good reason why it was passing this particular law or that particular law. So again, we'll see some overlap between the category of statute and the category of public policy. I'm certainly not going to ask you to distinguish whether a particular legal concept is a statute or public policy, um, but we, I am going to ask that you know these categories, whether they fit in, under the umbrella of statute or they fit under the umbrella of public policy. I'm going to follow the paradigm that the textbook has established, but again, eh, it may not be that useful for our particular class. Okay, um, a, a related concept can happen when when we have a perfectly lawful contract and then the legislature comes in and changes the law, makes something that was lawful unlawful. So let me give an example of that. Um, when I started college, when I was 18 years old, in a state in which I was attending college, it was lawful for 18 year olds to drink. Uh, I can't remember if we could drink hard liquor, but we could drink beer and wine, okay? Anyway, so imagine that I had entered into a contract with a beer distributor. The beer distributor agreed to drop off a keg at my dorm room every Friday at 5 p.m., and I would pay uh, the price of that keg. Anyway, this continued for several weeks. Uh, the, the keg would be dropped off. I would pay promptly, and it would continue on in this pattern. Um, and then suddenly the legislature changed the law and suddenly made the drinking age in this state to be 21. I was still 18, and people who were 18, 19, and 20 were not grandfathered. So we went from being able to lawfully drink to not being able to drink you know, at, literally at midnight on a particular night. And so let's imagine that, that the, the, the day that the law changed was a Wednesday. So the Friday before my contract with the beer distributor was in effect, the beer distributor had a legal obligation to uh, drop off the keg and I had a legal obligation to pay for that keg. But that next Friday, the beer distributor not only did not have a legal obligation to drop off the keg, it would have been legally prohibited from dropping off the keg. And naturally, I didn't have to pay for a keg I wasn't going to get. And so the intervening law, which made the contract illegal, um, made the contract null and void. It was no longer in effect. Now let's say that on the day that the contract changed, I had not yet paid for that last keg of beer. I'm still 18. The law prohibits me from drinking alcohol at that point, or certainly purchasing alcohol at that point. But my obligations under the contract when the contract was legal remain in force. So I'm going to be required to pay for that keg of beer that I got lawfully back before the law changed. So um, that's an example of how that can play out. So for these statutes, we're going to look at four statutes. We're going to look at use, use, usury laws. We're going to look at wagery, wage, uh, waging laws, wage, wagering laws, I guess. <laughs> Betting laws, we'll call them that. We'll talk about blue laws, which are sometimes called Sabbath laws or Sabbath observance laws. And we're also going to discuss licensing laws. And so let's get started. So usury. Usury is the charging of a rate of interest that exceeds the rate permitted by law. Um, this is uh, something that is driven by state law. Every state has 
a schedule of uh, interest rates that can be charged under particular circumstances. I'm going to show you those rates in just a second. Um, it's not important that you know the particular rates for Texas, and in fact, it's such a complex area, the law, that um, I'm not going to ask you to know any of the rates in Texas because uh, there's just too much, too many of those to, to know about. The important takeaway is that this is a highly regulated area and that if you happen to end up practicing in this area, you want to make sure that you know uh, what particular category of loan you're either entering into as a consumer or you are providing as a lender to make sure you are using the correct interest rates. Um, and again, the, the reason that there's so much variation, I guess it's kind of sensible, is that there are greater and lesser risks associated with certain loans. Um, payday loans, for example, have a very high risk of uh, non-payment on the part of the lender. I'm sorry, not the lender, the, uh, the, the debtor. And so you can see how in the, under those circumstances, lenders aren't going to be willing to loan under those circumstances unless they are guaranteed a high rate of, of, uh, of interest to make up for the fact that there will be people who don't pay. There are other uh, interest rates that are much more secure, for example, when they are secured by uh, something of significant value, such as a home or a car or something along those lines. So there's lots of variation. The legislature, when it establishes these rates, looks to the type of the transaction and the risk of non-payment that the lender is going to bear. So what happens if a contract is held to be usurious? Well, generally speaking, the contract is going to be held to be void. Uh, what a court actually does, though, can really vary. A court could say, for example, let's say, well, let me just flip to the other page so you can see an example of the interest rates we're talking about. Um, let's say... Um, it's a commercial loan, uh, and the, the rule is generally that it cannot be more than 18% annually, although the loan may float with inflation to 24%. So let's say that I enter into a commercial loan, I'm the lender, and I enter into a commercial loan with Bob, and I charge Bob 130% on this interest rate. Per, per year. That's the interest rate. Well, that's well in excess of any of the lawful limits. We have more than 100% higher than that. And so um, I'm not close to the line. I am so far over the line, I can't even see the line from where I am. And so I'm in pretty egregious uh, breach of that rule. Anyway, Bob doesn't pay me. Maybe I sue him to enforce it. And it comes to light that I am in very, very serious breach of the us usury laws. Well, the court has some options. The court can say, okay, well, we're just going to lower the interest rate to the lawful max, depending upon the circumstances. Maybe it's 18%, maybe it's 24%, maybe it's 28%. But whatever that number is, it says we're going to move it to that particular number. That's one solution that the court can make. Another solution the court can make is say, listen, Bureau, you are so out of control, charging way over the legal limit. We're just going to not make there be any interest rate. Um, it's going to be a 0% interest rate. And so, um, you know, you're not ever going to see a return on your money. Okay, that would be a punitive type measure. I mean, in a way, the, the first plan, which was to reduce it to legal uh, maximum, really wasn't penalizing me, the bad lender, for my shenanigans. It's just giving me what I, what the maximum that I could have gotten, even if I had played by the rules. So that's kind of an argument against the first choice, but there's also a pretty good argument against the second choice. I mean, Bob is getting free money now. You could say, well, I mean, Groover, you, you shouldn't have um, uh, charged that usurious interest rate. It, it makes sense for you to be penalized. Well, okay, that does make sense. But should Bob get a free loan out of it? Maybe so, maybe not. But you can see how there's a legitimate issue about Bob getting a windfall under those circumstances. It's even possible that a court could, could just forgive the loan entirely and say that Bob doesn't even have to pay back the money, the principal that he borrowed. Again, that would be a third choice. So you can see that would be the, the true finding the contract void. Um, so those are some options that the court has. You won't ever be sure exactly what the court's going to do. That's why, as a lender, you want to make sure that you're safely on the side of the non-usurious rate. Heavily regulated areas, credit cards, installment contracts, payday loans, car title loans, things like that, very, very regulated, as, as it should be, because uh, oftentimes people who are getting loans um, at the pawn shop or, or elsewhere are in a difficult financial position, and so they are the people who can least afford to pay very, very high interest rates. 
again, don't worry about knowing any of these numbers. This is just provided uh, so that you can kind of have a sense or a flavor of how this, this area of the law works. Of course, if you're interested in finding out more of the specifics, you can certainly go to the Texas statutes. We'll be playing around with Texas statutes later, and we'll show you where to find those. Let's consider the idea of wagering. Generally speaking, wagering or betting is not lawful in Texas. Um, the idea is that that is something that puts people at risk. Uh, some people uh, can experience um, an addictive quality to gaming, and they can also uh, bet money that they don't have, which can result in financial harm to them, and it can also be harmful to the family. Uh, of which they are a member. Finally, it can be harmful to the state in that um, it may be necessary for the state to come in and assist families uh, so that children are fed and have clothes and things like that. And so there's a risk to the kind of the fabric of society from that perspective. I think historically also there was moral concerns that had, were raised about uh, getting something for nothing, those ideas that they were not a character building activities maybe in the way that that uh, the state of Texas would have preferred that people um, uh, engage in leisure activities. So again all states uh, regulate this. Uh, most states prohibit most forms of wagering. Of course there are some exceptions. Um, obviously uh, some examples would be um, uh, Nevada has a gaming industry that's very robust. We also see that in, um, in Atlantic City and New Jersey and along portions of the Mississippi River. We also see that on some Indian reservations um, in, uh, uh, for example, uh, Oklahoma. So we do have some of that in the United States, but most parts of the United States have limited or no gambling. So what does Texas permit in the area of gambling? Well, we can have charitable bingo and raffles. So for example, um, uh, the VFW could have uh, some kind of bingos or raffles. Church groups could. Other organizations designed to raise money can do those types of activities. We have a state-run lottery. Obviously, this is something that the state is controlling, uh, but allows people to buy the tickets. And then we have some, uh, again, very regulated betting for horses and greyhounds. I don't know if we currently have any greyhound tracks, but we could have them in the future. Um, so those are some e examples. We don't have, you know, poker. We don't have slot machines. Uh, we don't have other types of games of chance. Sometimes it comes up, well, what can people in the privacy of their own homes do in terms of gambling? Um, there are some ways where people can run lawful, um, uh, gambling activities outside of their home homes. Um, it's a pretty complex area. I'm not an expert at all. It can be done. Um, even when it's not being done strictly legally, I don't think the, the cops are going to be necessarily that interested if we're talking small stakes and just a, a friendly game between friends. But uh, technically, many of those types of endeavors are unlawful in Texas because of our prohibition against wagering. Um, imagine for a second that um, you uh, uh, work in an office. We'll say the whole class works in an office. So there's, we'll say about 25 people in this class and we all work in an office and we're all big uh, college basketball fans. We're going into March Madness and um, I'm one of your coworkers and I say, listen, I'm going to set up a bracket for all of us. Anyone who wants to, to buy into it can do so. Um, if everybody, we'll say 20 people participate, everyone kick in $10, we'll have $200. Well, I'll take 20 bucks for my, my uh, administering fees. And so uh, whoever has the best bracket score at the end will get $180. Everybody's excited. Everybody submits their brackets. I tabulate. I keep everyone posted. It is now um, the, the final uh, March Madness week. We've done the final four. Now it's the final game. Anyway, uh, we, we see who wins 
and um, it happens that Bob is the big winner of the has the best bracket he predicted the most wins and so he comes in the next day very excited expecting to get his $150 everyone's congratulating him and he comes to see me says hey Groover you know I, I won the, the the brackets I go yeah you sure did that's awesome Bob congratulations and he goes oh thank you very much um, like to get my $180 and I go oh I can see how you would like that that would be neat if you were gonna be getting $180 that would be kind of icing on the cupcake of your big uh, a March Madness win and he goes well yeah it would be and, and yeah I want it and I go well it's good to want things Bob um, but unfortunately you're not gonna get it he's like what what do you mean I go well actually Bob what we were doing was unlawful in the state of Texas we were wagering um, this was not a game of skill according to the Texas Attorney General and so therefore um, we're both <laughs> guilty of a crime imagine that and as a result I'm just have decided I'm gonna go ahead and keep the the two hundred dollars but you have my hearty congratulations did a great job you are super amazing Bob is like what what but but it's it's my money and I'm like, no it's it's not it's not your money it's, it's my money now and so goodbye anyway his tongue is hanging out of his mouth in amazement I am now the least popular person at work um, but the fact remains that probably from a legal standpoint as much of a jerk as I was I'm probably right because he um, is is equally guilty with me as a participant and his decision to um, uh, buy the um, or buy into the the, uh, the brackets um, makes him guilty makes me guilty and so therefore the court isn't going to enforce our contract um, so uh, so don't do that <laughs> don't don't engage in March Madness um, or at least uh, be aware that there's some some risk of maybe being disappointed um, now of course if you were if we were doing this in Vegas and we followed all the rules then there wouldn't be a problem of course it's a regulated area in Vegas that um, a, an office pool like this wouldn't actually work okay so let's talk about Sabbath laws a sentence are called blue laws sometimes they're called Sabbath laws um, going back to ancient history when I was a very young person um, stores in Texas just weren't open on Sundays um, the malls were closed uh, malls were open on Saturdays if you needed to buy clothes of course there was no internet you really were out of luck you needed to buy them on Saturday um, even if you wanted to buy some pretty standard stuff uh, from the CDS or or the uh, the Walgreens you were sometimes hard-pressed to buy them on Sunday um, I uh, had a friend who uh, worked at a, a Walgreens at that time and he would relay a story about how um, before noon there were certain items there was a, a fairly complicated list of items that could be sold and items that could not be sold for example he could sell um, cloth diapers before noon but he could not sell disposable diapers before noon um, and the idea was I think that the cloth diapers were necessities if you had a child a child that was not potty trained you obviously needed to have the child in diapers and so cloth diapers was a necessity but disposable diapers was a luxury item you didn't have to have the disposable variety the cloth variety would do the job as well and so I think that was the idea so the idea was on Sundays you were really supposed to only buy life's essentials things that you needed to have to function for the day that was a law back in 1984 um, the law changed though in the mid 80s and in Texas the vast vast majority of blue laws went away many people think that this law change happened because of some kind of constitutional challenge that someone filed a lawsuit saying uh, that's uh, inconsistent with um, our uh, secular state that, that we don't enforce religious rules on the citizens uh, you know that, that we can't uh, require businesses to remain closed because of a religious uh, observance um, that sounds like a good explanation but it really isn't um, there haven't been courts that have held 
that Sabbath and, and, and also called blue laws are unconstitutional. Certainly, um, many have been challenged and I think most have been upheld. So it's not that function, but, but there was in the mid eighties, this trend, it wasn't just in Texas, but in other states to remove these blue laws. Um, there are still jurisdictions though that have a significant number of blue laws. So there are places still today in the United States where you would find it difficult to uh, buy certain things on Sundays, usually is the typical day. So how did blue laws come to change? Well, it's a pretty, interesting subject, something I'm not an expert about, but my understanding is it had to do with um, politics more than anything else. I mean, I'm sure there were people who sincerely believed from a religious standpoint that this was the right way to conduct one's business and one's life. Um, but at the end of the day, I think politics was the tiebreaker, the, the part of the, of the process that, that tilted uh, in a different direction. And what happened was real estate, I'm sorry, uh, retail businesses liked Sabbath laws. Um, the idea was if I wanted to buy a sofa um, and the sofa store was open only on Sundays, then I would know that I needed to shop on Sundays. And so I would sh concentrate my sofa shopping on Sundays. I'm sorry, on Saturday, let's say, say, let's say that the, the furniture store was closed on Sundays. Well, I would know I need to shop on Saturdays. Um, if the furniture store is open on Saturdays and Sundays, then I have a choice. I can shop on Saturday or I can shop on Sunday. But you know what? Even though it's open twice as many days over the weekend, I'm not going to buy twice as many sofas. It's just not going to happen. If I need one sofa, I'm just going to buy one sofa. And if this furniture store is open just on Saturday, that's when I'm going to go and shop. So furniture stores and car dealerships and other large clothing too, but, but really large purchase purchase items, they really realized that they could restrict their hours, but not restrict, but, but that would not inadvertently restrict the demand for their items. If they restricted their hours, they found that many of their overhead costs would decline. They had to pay fewer employees. They had to air condition and heat um, their buildings for fewer days of the week. And so there was a savings. They would sell as many furniture, if sell as many, you know, sofas and cars, but expend less money. And that was true also for most retail items, clothing and things like that. And so it was a, a good deal for retailers. Uh, but as uh, the culture shifted and people became more comfortable with the idea of shopping on Sundays, uh, the general population started saying, wait a second, we want uh, to have more flexibility in our shopping experience. And of course, as soon as the law was changed, it was just a matter of time before the first retailer says, well, we're going to be open on Sunday too. And once one retailer, once one furniture store said we're open on Sunday, then all of the others had to be open to be competitive. Because even though people weren't suddenly going to buy two sofas, they had more than one place to buy a sofa. And so if um, you were only open on Saturday, but your competitors were open on Saturday and Sunday, then you were giving the, the competitor a competitive advantage over you. So the only restrictions that we have today are with respect to liquor and cars. Um, and we can see with liquor how there is a, somewhat of a moral implication to that. And so um, liquor stores are no longer, are still not open on Sundays. And I don't believe you can buy liquor by the, by the drink before um, noon, at least not in, a, maybe you can in a mixed drink, but not uh, on noon on the Sundays. Uh, the rules about cars are reflective probably of the fact that car dealerships are, remain a strong lobby in Texas to this day. And so uh, car dealers have been able to maintain their blue law and their blue law is a little bit different than what I was suggesting. And that was that a car dealership has a choice to make. It can be open on Saturdays or it can be open on Sundays. It can't be open both days. And as a result, most car dealers choose to be open on Saturday and choose to be closed on Sunday. And again, the idea is, you know, if you need a car, you're going to get a car. 
but the fact that they're open only on Saturdays means you're going to know to shop on Saturday. If they were open Saturday and Sunday, you're not going to buy two cars. So it's uh, going to be the same market, uh, same level of demand. Um, so that's how the blue laws work today. Let's talk about a related, or actually it's not really related, but, but another statute that is uh, kind of important to think about, and that is um, unlicensed performance laws. We have lots of licenses. I'm just going to put some up here, show you some examples of industries where you have to have a license. These are not exhaustive lists. These are just examples. Um, you can see that you need to have a license to fix air conditioning units. I mean, that makes sense. You need a license to be an auctioneer. Okay. You need a license to uh, uh, maybe repair boilers. Makes sense. You need a license to be an electrician. Okay, I, I get that. You need a license if you're going to be a hearing instrument fitter. I guess that's a hearing aid. You need a license if you are a laser hair removal person. You need a license if you're a massage therapist. And some of these are pretty obvious, but some of these might be surprising. You need an, an office, excuse me, a license if you want to be a tow truck business or if you want to be a water well driller. Let's look at some other lists here. You need one if you want to be an acupuncturist. You need one if you want to be a competitive sports promoter. Or how about if you want to be a child care administrator, maybe running a child care center. You need to have a license if you are going to be a, um, an interpreter for the deaf or if you are going to be a professional librarian in a county um, library. You also need one if you are going to be a, um, a, an installer of an on-site sewage facility. Also, if you are a pawnbroker or a pesticide a, um, a, applier. And you can see we have polygraph examiner, um, just lots of different fields. Um, um, that we see the need for licenses. Um, another example that we need a license or a permit for is for deer breeders. We'll talk more about that in just a second. These are just examples of uh, industries where you need to have a license. So obviously you need to be a license to be a doctor. We'd all kind of see that coming. After all, if anyone could call himself or herself a doctor, then it would be hard for you and I as laypersons to figure out who's actually going to provide appropriate medical care. There have been cases where people have pretended to be doctors or at least have performed medical services uh, for individuals that only a doctor should provide. There was a sad case of some women who pretended, I'm not sure if they pretended to be a doctor, but anyway, they performed medical services on, on women. They in, in injected industrial grade, I want to say cement, into these women's bodies to give uh, them a little bit of a plastic surgery advantage, we'll put it that way. And some of these women died from the treatment. Um, and the, these uh, women who were providing the services were prosecuted for crimes. But you can imagine, let's say that um, I go to see one of these uh, women who is going to is planning on injecting cement into my body so that I have a little bit more oomph in my physique. And um, the procedure goes forward, and let's say I don't have an adverse reaction, I'm, I'm fine, but I discovered that they're not doctors. Well, you can see how I wouldn't probably want to pay them because they have violated the rules by providing medical services for me. So the issue is going to be, well, what kind of contract do I have under these circumstances? Um, and because after all, this is an unlicensed performance. They're not legally permitted to perform these medical services, and yet they did so anyway. And we've talked about how this type of situation would ordinarily be a void contract. Yes, if a contract is deemed illegal, it is void and unenforceable. 
But let's say I had prepaid for the service. And then I find out that this person isn't licensed to perform the service. They haven't actually performed the service for me yet. I want a refund. Well, that fake doctor could say, wait a second, I'm an unlicensed person. I don't, can't perform that service. So our contract is illegal. So our contract is void and I don't have to pay you back the money. I mean, that would be a pretty crazy uh, turn of events because the whole reason for the law requiring a license is to ensure that I, the patient, am safe. And so um, we have two categories in this area. We have the goal where the law, the regulation is regulatory. It is intended to protect the public, me, the potential patient. So in that situation, a contract with that unlicensed fake doctor will not be enforceable against the consumer. So the, the doctor isn't going to be able to sue me for any balance that I owe him or her. But I am the victim. I am the person who's designed to be protected by this law, so I could sue the fake doctor. And this would apply to anyone in the medical field who doesn't have a license that he or she should have. So it could be a registered nurse. It could be a psychologist or um, a dentist or a dental hygienist or all of the other positions in the medical field. Similarly, in the legal field, um, an attorney uh, who or somebody who represents himself or herself as an attorney um, would not be able to successfully sue a client for services rendered, for example, but the client could successfully sue the attorney under those situations. So you can see if the reason that we require these licenses to protect the public, we're um, only going to allow one-way enforcement of the laws. But many of these licenses also have another component, and some other component can be the more important component. And that is it's intended to generate revenue for the state. And so in that situation, the contract with the unlicensed persons is probably going to be enforceable. I mean, the state may come along and fuss and get mad at the unlicensed person for not having a license when he or she should. Imagine, for example, that um, I, uh, I don't know if we have this kind of license in Texas, but let's imagine that we do. That we have a rule that says if you want to be a fishing guide, you need a special license. We'll say that a fishing license for somebody over the age of 18 costs, uh, we'll say $20. But this fishing guide license costs $200, but it's good for the whole year. Anyway, um, I a, have a little business off of Lake, uh, we'll say Lake, Texoma. And I take people out fishing. I know all the best spots to get the best fish. And um, I uh, take groups of about five people out of my boat. Anyway, there's five friends who want to go out and get a tour. They contact me. They each pay me, we'll say, $100 for a day's worth of fishing. <coughs> Excuse me. They each have their own fishing license. <coughs> And I take them out. I have all the right paperwork for the boat that I'm driving. And I take them to wonderful places to go fishing. They catch several fishes. Um, They're very, very happy with their experience. We're back at the dock at the end of the day. We're getting off the boat. And you now I'm at the point where I'm collecting the fees. And um, the first person gladly pays me $100 and gives me a $10 tip. The next person gladly pays me $100, gives me a $5 tip. The next person gladly pays me $100 and gives me, you know, maybe no tip. But anyway, he's happy enough. And then the, the fourth person pays me $100 maybe with a $20 tip. Anyway, the last person says, yeah, you know, let, let me get my money out. And he goes, but, but before I pay you, I just want to look at that fishing guide license that you have. And I go, oh, well, actually, my fishing guide license just expired last week, I haven't gone out and renewed it. Because, oh, well, then, I mean, you're not licensed, so um, I'm not required to pay you anything. And in fact, I don't think my friends should have to pay you anything. Well, under those circumstances, I would say probably the whole reason for the fishing guide license is economic. It's designed to generate revenue for the state. And then it's not really designed to protect the fishers, fishing population. Um, but there could be arguments to the contrary. I mean, it could be that part of that fishing license, fishing guide license was that I had to be trained in boat safety, that I had to be trained in CPR and water rescue. Maybe I need to be able to swim a certain distance at a certain speed. 
Um, there may be some requirements that are safety related, how to handle a first aid when somebody gets hooked by a, by a, uh, uh, a fish hook or, or things along those lines. Um, so it might be a judgment call whether it's mainly designed to be regulatory or mainly designed to be economic. But if the course were conclude that it was mainly an economic issue, then the my my customers are going to need to go ahead and pay me the one hundred dollars they owe me, even though they can turn me into the state and maybe I'm going to have to pay some fine or something along the lines of those in that regard. So it's important to know whether it's primarily regulatory or primarily economic. And I would say probably this one is going to be regulatory. Well, certainly this one's going to be regulatory, as is this one. But probably the deer breeding is going to be economic. Um, let me just flip on up here and show you. Um, wrong, wrong screen. <laughs> here we go. Okay, so um, you can, so let's just pull up the deer breeding permit application. Um, there's a processing fee. Um, this is going to allow you to um, uh, keep some deer. The deer breeder permit authorizes individuals to hold white-tailed and mule deer. You'll want to remember this one, white-tailed and mule deer in capti captivity for the purpose of propagation. A deer breeder permits and all the applicable reports requirements include release site registration are managed through the, this online system. So let's say I enter into a contract with somebody relating to my role as a deer breeder. But you know what? My application hasn't been gone through successfully. Um, it doesn't seem like this is really going to be about protecting deer or protecting other people from, you know, I don't know, uh, some type of violation that they don't want to have happen to them. Um, um, and so I would say this is probably more economic or maybe um, management of, of wildlife resources. So this one I would say with white-tailed and mule deer, would fit in the category of um, more the economic than the uh, regulatory. Certainly not, the concern is not the general public. Let me put it that way, perhaps more so. Okay, so let's go to our next slide. <clears throat> So contracts may be illegal if they violate a statute. So we've covered the statutes that the textbook discusses, and now we're going to move on to public policy. Um, before we go into public policy, I'm going to flip on over and I'm going to cover the Texas Constitution. Here we go. Um, here we go, Texas Constitution. I'm going to be in the first article of the Texas Constitution, which we call the Bill of Rights. It's not exactly like the Bill of Rights that we have in the U.S. Constitution, though there's some similarities. And um, we can see how we have, uh, e we have an Equal Rights Clause. All free men, when they form a social compact, have equal rights, and no man or set of men is entitled to exclusive, separate pub public emulence or privileges Or, but in consideration of public services. And then we have equality under the law. Equality under the law shall not be denied or abridged because of sex, race, color, creed, or national origin. This amendment is self-operative. And then we have one on religious tests. You can see lots of these amendment, uh, these, these bills of rights um, sound very much like public policy. And so you can see how if uh, the Texas state legislature, say, were to pass a law that treated people of different national origin differently, then it would run afoul of this Bill of Rights in the Texas Constitution. Similarly, if a statute were to provide for a religious test of some type, um, then under those circumstances, 
the, uh, the Texas Constitution would render that particular statute unconstitutional. So these kind of reflect some public policy issues that we have. Let me show you a particular one I wanted to draw attention to, and that is um, kind of down here for a ways. Ah, section 12, habeas corpus. Habeas corpus. You're going to want to know this one, so uh, you might want to write down the spelling of it. Habeas corpus in Latin literally means um, what, or let, let us have the corpse, or let us have the body. And it is a right that um, is part of the English common law, and it was a right that um, uh, means that if a person is incarcerated, they can apply to the court saying, hey, I was unjustly or unreasonably incarcerated. I should be released, and the court has to review the matter. This is called a collateral attack. This is not a direct appeal, but a collateral appeal. After all of your ordinary appeals are completed, you can still attack your incarceration through a habeas petition. Now, you may have heard about the habeas petition relating to the Civil War. Uh, during World War, sorry, during the Civil War, President Lincoln suspended the writ of habeas corpus for the uh, progression of the uh, the Civil War, and it was obviously re-implemented afterwards. But uh, anyway, just know about this one because this is a helpful protection to be aware that we have as citizens the right to, to habeas corpus. It definitely reflects a public policy um, position that the state of Texas has. Okay, let's go back um, and we'll talk more about public policy here. And we have six specific areas of public policy. Um, in an earlier version of this textbook, we actually had a seventh, which had to do with um, uh, same-sex marriage issues. But of course, with the U.S. Supreme Court's decision, finding that that is a constitutionally protected right, the textbook was rewritten to no longer include that provision. And so you can see how the law changes over time, either because of technolo technological changes, uh, social changes, uh, political changes, um, new interpretations of, of statutes and constitutions, that um, this is a, a constantly a moving target. What are protected rights? How, what are the scope of those rights? Um, they are not forever cemented um, to mean one thing and only one thing. Okay, so let's talk about public policy. So contracts, obviously, that violate public, public policy, we find that they do so when they are perceived to be deeply unfair, when they offend the public's moral sensibilities, or when they are oppressive. And the examples that, again, the textbook goes through are surrogacy, a frozen embryo donors, or uh, sperm don donors, a premarital or prenuptial agreements, and palimony agreements. We also have the sale of human organs or the sale of, of bone marrow non-competition agreements, and exculpatory clauses. For the most part in Texas, we've got statutes. I don't know if we have a statutes on the exculpatory clauses, but the rest of these, we all have statutes on them. So we don't really folk, we don't have a lot of issues um, in which we don't have a statute. So if, if, if this textbook were written strictly for a Texas audience, we, he would have, the, the textbook author would have either had to have come up with different public policy issues or she would have eliminated the public policy issue and just had everything part of the statute. So this is a little bit different experience that we have. But you can imagine other states might not have statutes in this area. And of course, Texas once upon a time wouldn't have had statutes in these areas. Certainly wouldn't have had a surrogacy, surrogacy statute, for example. Okay, so let's talk first of all about surrogacy. Uh, let me pause and share with you a little bit of an anecdote here with respect to surrogacy. When I was in law school in the late 80s, there was a very big case. It was called the Baby M case, and it was a situation that rose out of the state of New Jersey. In that particular circumstance, um, a husband and wife uh, chose not to have any biological children because the wife had an illness. I can't remember what it was. Maybe it was multiple sclerosis. But anyway, it was a very serious illness. And so they decided not to have a biological child of their own. But the husband very much wanted to have a biological child. And I, I believe the circumstance was that he was um, 
from a family who had been decimated during the Holocaust in Germany. And so he had very few um, uh, living family members and he really felt it was important to continue his family if he was at all able to, given the tragedy that his family had experienced. So um, they were in this predicament. She wasn't able to have a child for him but he very much wanted to have a biological child and an adoptive child though I'm sure would have been loved uh, would not have fully satisfied what he wanted uh, in his life and so they hired a woman to um, be the surrogate now this was back in the 80s where the technology wasn't as advanced as it was today so there was no option of using an egg from the wife and implanting it inside the surrogate Instead, through artificial insemination, the surrogate's own egg was impregnated by the husband who, who uh, wanted to have the child. And so the surrogate mother was carrying a child that was biologically hers and was biologically the child of the husband who wanted the child. In this particular case, the surrogate mother uh, was married and had biological children of her own already. And she agreed that she would give up custody of the child once the child was born. As the pregnancy continued, however, she decided that that was not what she wanted to do. And she sought to uh, uh, keep the child, at least have some uh, custodial relationship with the child, and um, the, uh, the uh, couple that initially kind of started this plan uh, did not want that. They wanted her to relinquish her parental rights. And they wanted it so that um, she, as maybe like a traditional adoption might occur. And then the, uh, the wife who had the multiple sclerosis would be able to adopt the child. Well, um, this became a big, big case. I mean, it was very, very big news and lots of controversy and people had very strong opinions both ways on this issue. Um, and then it ultimately was tried in court and the New Jersey court had to decide what to do. And there really were not statutes or laws that pertain to this matter. It was really new territory. And so the uh, New Jersey court had to consider making analogies between other cases because this was really an issue of first impression. Anyway, the court eventually decided in that particular case that um, the uh, surrogate mother was in fact the, the mother. She was clearly the biological mother, but she was also the legal mother of the child, as of course was the father who had provided um, his DNA for the um, insemination. And so they were co-parents, basically. And so the, the a surrogate mother was awarded a visitation rights. Um, and uh, that's what happened in that case. So um, a after this, or as this case was percolating, many, many states started saying, well, what do we want to be the outcome? Do we want these to be lawful? Do we want them to be unlawful? And states arrived at a variety of different answers. And the one that Texas came up with was that it ought to be lawful but heavily regulated. So let's consider how it works in Texas, at least in very brief terms. So a surrogacy contract is a situation in which a woman who hosts these fertilized egg or another woman of, I guess it should be of another woman, and again, now that technology has advanced many times, the surrogate is not the biological mother of the child. She's, I think this is called a gestational mother. Um, she hosts the fertilized egg of another woman in her womb or is artificially inseminated with the sperm of a man who is in a relationship with someone else, agrees to assign her parental, it might be easier to understand this way. and agrees to assign our parental rights to the donors. So as I say, in states where we don't have a statute in this area, then you would look to the public policy of the state, much as what was done in the Baby M case in New Jersey. Um, so the, the issues that the public policy concerns are gonna be economic coercion. In many cases, um, the couple who wants the surrogacy arrangement are well-to-do. 
and in many cases they hire women of lesser economic uh, positions and in fact there's a, a very much a trend nowadays for this to be international and so uh, couples are or some of just single people are going to third world countries India and other countries uh, to have uh, women be the gestational uh, providers for for them uh, the idea being these women are uh, a, are willing to perform the service for significantly less money and there are sometimes fewer legal protections for these women so it's easier for the um, consumer the person who wants a child to um, use their economic abilities to get the result that they want anyway that's one of the concerns that exists another is the interest of the child um, there have been cases in which um, uh, couples in their contract have said well if there's um, or there's um, abnormalities with the developing uh, fetus for example the fetus has down syndrome or some birth defect spina bifida or something like that that the uh, uh, surrogate is required to uh, terminate the pregnancy now the law would never make her terminate but the law could say well you're you're in breach of the contract so therefore you aren't entitled to whatever services you were supposed to get under the terms of the contract so you can see how if the adopt or the uh, the individual seeking a surrogacy arrangement um, aren't able to or aren't willing to provide the best interest of the child how there can be an issue along those lines and then finally there's a concern about the cell of a human uh, the, in this case being the baby now in the baby m case it was uh, clear that the father was in fact the biological father so he wasn't really buying a child he was the father of the child but if it were a situation in which he wasn't the biological father of the child um, then that would be much closer to the selling circumstance. Um, we have these types of contracts in Texas. They're called gestational agreements. They can be enforceable if the rules in the statute are cover, carry, uh, carried out very carefully. And again, this is an area of the law, if, if you are a family law provider, that you might be involved in, uh, making sure that those laws are followed. Um, I would say that surrogacy has become a more important industry over the last 30 or so years, in part because of infertility problems that some couples experience, and also some same-sex couples, as well as some single people seek the services of a surrogate. So it's uh, not a huge industry, but certainly um, something that, especially if you practice in the family law area, you may see. And of course, uh, you'd want to make sure you're following the, the statute ex exactly. So we're not really thinking about it in Texas from a public policy standpoint because once a statute is passed, the assumption is that the Texas legislature, and they're, the idea is that they're the experts in what's the public policy of our state, they have codified what that public policy is. A related topic is frozen embryo and sperm donor agreements. Um, imagine that a husband and wife um, have maybe infertility problems and so, or maybe one or both of them had some concern about cancer or some other disease so they had um, uh, sperm harvested or eggs harvested or maybe even embryo harvested and frozen. Well, the marriage doesn't end up being successful and so now there are these embryos who owns those embryos um, it could be that um, one of those partners would like to use those embryos even after the divorce but the other partner wants those embryos destroyed and there can be all kinds of levels for example maybe one wants them uh, donated to another family or another uh, uh, maybe medical research who knows what the the avenue might be for that and so there can be uh, you know custody battles you could say about what ought to be the um, proper uh, destination or treatment of these types of in entities uh, there was a case uh, recently relatively recently where a woman um, uh, had a or her husband uh, became very ill and they knew that he would be passing away and so uh, they froze his sperm 
um, he did pass away and a couple of years later she decided to be artificially inseminated with his sperm and she became pregnant and bore a healthy child. Then she sought Social Security survivor benefits for the child because um, the child's father was dead and according to the Social Security law um, he would be entitled to um, income or some, some benefits from the Social Security Administration. The Social Security Administration challenged that saying, well, when you had the insemination, you knew that the father was, was passed away. And so um, you, you went into the situation kind of knowing the deal, and so therefore you aren't entitled to Social Security disability benefits. I don't know what the court ultimately decided in that case, but you can see uh, the complexities of the issues that can come up. Um, I was reading on a discussion board the other day about um, a unfortunately a young man who was in his 20s and he was um, in an accident and the, the, the his wife um, wanted um, his sperm to be uh, harvested from his body before life support was removed for that same purpose that she was anticipating perhaps um, having artificial insemination. So this is a thing. I'm not saying it's common, but you can see how it raises interesting issues. It's not, obviously the person has passed away. They, they don't really have a claim, but you can see how um, there could be issues if, if it were a divorce situation. Um, again, the when agreements exist, we can look to the Texas statute to see if the uh, agreement comports with the requirements of this Texas statute. In some of these situations, there aren't any pre-existing agreements, so you would see some public policy concerns in play under these circumstances. I'm going to end the lecture at this point. We will continue um, uh, in a second lecture covering more of this material, so be sure to tune in. As always, if you have questions about the material, be sure to send me an email or even better, stop by my office hours. I would love to talk to you in more detail about the material. Thanks for your attention as always and have a wonderful day.